Dre and Suge and Doc are putting together the Chronic, and then Snoop comes around, and then that oh, was yeah, like... They, they all came. Snoop, Daz, Corrupt. We had all, the, the, what, what we did was, once we said, okay, once Scrooby said, hey, I'm going to be part of this company, what I will do is I will make available to you the whole third floor. We had third floor in our office building. It was a creative floor. It had... Um, a space that was a rehearsal space. It had a, had the studio. It had a number of different small offices, which were like really production offices and stuff. That became the death row space. Okay. So they're working on the Chronic at this point. Working on Chronic and other stuff too. And other stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think or like primarily Chronic. Deep Cover, I think. Deep Cover. Deep Cover. They worked on the same time. What What happens? We did. We 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 had the opportunity to do the soundtrack for Deep Cover. And what we decided we would do is that would be a way to introduce the death row artists to the world. So on the deep cover soundtrack, about I think half the songs were from death row artists. So, you know, we had the hit track, um, you know, 187 on Motherfucking Cop. Deep that, cover. Was, that was Snoop and Dre. Yeah. Uh, and then I think we had a cut on there by Joel. I think we had something else by by Daz and, yeah. and Corrupt, that were all in the deep cover soundtrack. That was a Solar record. Right. But it was, the idea was... Oh, oh that came out under a Solar record? Yeah, it was Solar oh, record. okay. That was a Solar record. Gotcha. You know, um, and, and so we put that record out, but it was like introducing the Death Row artists, because keep in mind, Griffey had an, had an equity stake in Death Row. So, yeah. so we were using the deep cover soundtrack as a way of introducing the death row artists to the world. So that was cut at the same time they were working on the chronic. Okay. So at some point, Harry O came into the picture. Yeah. Um, what do you understand happened with that? Uh, it, it's fuzzy because, you know, the, what, what, what ended up happening is, you know, a lot of these, these kids are catching criminal cases. Harry O is a legendary figure on the, the streets of LA. Yeah. Um, and he's someone Shug really looked up to. I mean, I think Shug wanted to be like Harry O. Right. He was a, a major gangster. He was a LA. major, major, major gangster. Yeah. yeah. And he was uh, in prison at the time. In prison at that time and this time too. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> um, he, he had gone, gone to, to jail because. Um, as I recall, there was somebody that was part of his family that had been taken out to the desert to be executed, and he survived. And then, as Kojak used to say, he started to sing like a speed freak canary and um, uh, implicated, you know, Harry O and a lot of other people. And so, so that's how Harry O ended up going to jail. Um, but David Kenner had been his lawyer. And what I've come to, to understand that I didn't understand is that he, Kenner, went to Suge and Harry O um, was, uh, put up a million dollars to be invested in death row. And, and they created another company, Godfather or something like that. Okay. And all of that was not disclosed to me or Dick at the time it was happening. And that happened while they were still in our building. Okay. Um, so Harry O thought that he was Harry O thought he was funded part of Death Row. E exactly, he but thought that he had bought half of Death Row. Okay, but in fact, it was a, some other spinoff company which had nothing associated with it. The, the answer is I, I, you know, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay, you, you know, you know, this is where where you, where you get into only um, uh, Suge and David Kenner can perhaps answer that. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think. I, and and I've, I spoke with Harry O. His view was that he was creating a company that was going to finance and own at, at least half, if not more, of Death Row Records. And that Death Row Records was going to be, uh, was a name that was going to be owned by Godfather Productions or something. Okay. And um, so dur during this period, because, you know, during the period of time they were in our, in, in our, in our building, in the Solar building, and recording you know, not only the chronic, but some of the, the things that were on, on the deep cover soundtrack. You know, Kenner started coming around. Uh, 
They even had a party at Chasen's and stuff. But none of, none of us from Solar were invited or were aware of what was going on. We had no idea that there was any involvement by Michael Harris or, or anyone. So. Okay. So the chronic is being put together. Mm -hmm. And then it gets shopped to various labels and Interscope ends up biting. Yes. So, so the, it, the context is always important. Sony was our partner for all things. Uh, and, and our idea was that Sony would become the distributor of Death Row Records. Right. Uh, but there was an incident in which, uh, I think it was an Ice-T record, Cop Killer, uh, was kind of a hit record. There was a guy who killed a highway patrolman in Texas. Right. And in his tape deck, he had cop killer. Um, there was a big brouhaha that erupted, and all of the major labels said, we're not touching gangster rap. Okay. So, so all of a sudden, we had no distributor for the record. Okay. Um, and not enough money to distribute it on our own independently. So Dick started looking around for somebody that might become a distributor. And um, John McLean Jr. was an, uh, an A&R guy at Interscope at that point in time. And uh, Dick was close to the McLean family. Uh, John's father was kind of like uh, Dick's godfather. You know, he had financed Dick early on in his career and doing concerts and stuff. And, and so John T. McLean was kind of somebody that Dick looked up to. And so he played the music for John Jr. And then John Jr. went back to, um, to Jimmy Ivey and said, I think I found something. And they offered Sugar Million Dollars if we bring the record there. And that's how the chronic ended up going to Interscope. Now, Death Row does a deal with Interscope, mm -hmm. but Solo Records is a 50% owner of Death Row. Griffey is a 50%. Griffey. Oh, not, not Solar Records. Not Solar Records. Oh, that was his own deal. That was his own deal. Aha. Uh -huh. It was not a Solar Records. It was a, it was a Dick Griffey personal deal. Okay. Um, and, uh, and Dick was a silent partner. And, 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 and he said, Shug, I have 42%. You have 15%. That means we control. But you have to take care of my share because Dick had a deal with Sony, which gave him the right to buy anything he had an interest in in the entertainment industry. And he did not want to sell that to Sony or even disclose it to Sony. Okay. So he didn't. And not only did he not sell it or disclose it to Sony, but it was never documented in writing because he didn't want there to be a writing saying, I have an interest because if Death Row takes off and, and Dick thought it was going to take off, then Sony would step in and say, we have the right to acquire it at a, at a really uh, a bargain basement price. Okay. So when Death Row signed to Interscope, Dick Griffey was a partner. He was a silent partner. A silent partner. Yeah. But he never got paid. So he actually ended up later on suing Suge okay. for his share. And right. that's a lawsuit that got settled. I understand. And yeah. from what I understand, um, the DOC got a chunk of money from Dick personally after that lawsuit. Right, did, yeah. yeah. Uh, because, see, the, the DOC, he was a partner too. I think, I think Suge just pushed him out hmm. because um, he pushed the DOC out and ultimately pushed Dre out. Uh, and Jimmy bought Dre's position and gave Dre aftermath. Death Row does a deal with Interscope mm -hmm. for distribution. Dick Griffey's a solid partner. Right. But Dre is still signed to Eazy-E. As an artist. As an artist. Correct. And he is performing as an artist all over the chronic. Correct. So then there is the whole story of how Suge met Eazy in a hotel room and Something happened where Easy signed off. Signed releases. Signed releases. But then the next day, Easy came back and said this was done under duress. Correct. Were you familiar with the situation as it was happening? Wasn't familiar with it as it was happening. I was familiar with 
the need to get a release if, if they were going to release uh, product with Dre uh, because he was still signed as an artist to NWA, which was signed to Ruthless Records. And I don't think that the allegations, as, as I understand it, didn't take place in a hotel room. It took place at third floor in the Solar Building. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, that's what my recollection is. Because, uh, you know, there's a lot of litigation and stuff that went back and forth. My recollection is that uh, Easy claimed he came up to the Solar Building for a meeting and they took him into one of the production rooms. I thought there were a bunch of little pr production offices around uh, outside the studio. And that in that room, he was threatened that, you know, he'd better sign a, a release and let Dre out of, out of his deal or else. And then he says he signed, he did sign the releases, but he signed them with duress. Um, and um, that's, that's Dre's story. I mean, that's easy story. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if Dre was in the meeting um, that took place. I think uh, Suge's story was that, um, he, he, yeah, he pushed him and he said, you know, you need to do this, you owe him, you didn't pay him, the da 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 da, you're gonna get sued if you don't let him go for all the royalties he's never been paid. And, you know, Suge is a big guy, Easy's a little guy, I wasn't there, but you know, that's what happened. So, well, I, I remember there was this uh, this line from Easy E on Compton uh, City G's where he said, "But Dre Day made Easy's payday." So ultimately, Easy ended up profiting from the Chronic and other projects, or, or just the Chronic. I don't know. I don't, no, don't know. know. I don't. Okay, know. but something got worked out. Yeah, something got worked out. You know what? what you know, my advice had been, hey, go talk to the guy, tell him you give him an override and stuff, you know, because you can't make an artist record. You can't make Dre go record with NWA. You can't make Dre go produce NWA, so they're going to get nothing. You know, it's better off for you to say, look, you're not going to get anything. Give us a release and we'll give you three-point override on records and stuff we do. Now, whether they did that or not, I have no idea. Okay, you weren't involved in that at all. I wasn't involved in that at okay. all. So the chronic comes out, mm -hmm. goes through the roof. Right. Depending on who you talk to, there is a segment of the population that says that this is the greatest hip hop album ever made. It was a great record. Great record. It was a great record. You, you know, there's a whole different, you know, Death Row created a whole different sound because Dre really was an R&B producer who ended up producing rap. And so the difference between really the death row sound and other stuff is that the music was really produced for the rapper. As opposed to what you get with a lot of East Coast rap that was coming out, then people would do a track and they'd rap on top of the track, but the track wasn't produced for the, for the, for the rapper. Yeah. Dre's music was produced for the performer. And so it, it sound, it's much more uh, melodic, yeah. you know? And so if you listen to all the stuff that, that Dre produced, he didn't produce a lot, but the stuff he produced, like if you listen to 187 on the motherfucking cop, or you listen to California, you know, Love with Tupac and stuff, yeah. there's a melody and, and the, the, the top, the, there's, there's a, first there's real melody that you don't, oftentimes don't get in a lot of rap music because you have a track with somebody rapping, there's no melody. Yeah. Um, most of the stuff that Dre produced had that R&B flavor mm -hmm. of a melody with music produced for the, for the rapper, but it also had a melody. Yeah. And so it's something that, that you can sing along or hum. Most rap music you can't hum. Yeah. Well, I mean, Dre's considered, if not the greatest, definitely one of the greatest you know, hip hop producers of all time. Probably one of the greatest producers of all time. For That's a right. reason. Yeah, 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 for a reason. I mean, yeah. he's, very, you know, he's a very musical guy. Uh, but he's not prolific, you know, which, is, which would be the one thing that may keep you from saying that he's one of the greatest because he doesn't have a large body of yeah. work, yeah. but he has a great body of work. Right, yeah. We waited for detox for like two decades. And it, and it yeah, right. 